Is that correct? Yes, we're seeing you. Great. Okay, great. So I wanted to talk to you this morning about uh, detailing structures in general. And uh, it's something I enjoy doing as a hobby and uh, was fortunate enough to turn it into a business, uh, making details and making our kits. Um, my wife and I run the business. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2013, but kind of full-time just in the past uh, two or three years. So things of production have really picked up in the past couple of years. So uh, this morning, what we're gonna do is uh, talk about detailing and basically uh, kind of a couple of different points would be to study the prototype. So what are you trying to achieve in, um, in, uh, in scale? that uh, and what what details should you do to make the model and make it a representation of of uh, of the full size and, and full size prototype so then the level of detail we'll talk about uh, kind of how much detail is possible today with laser cutting and, and 3d printing um, and then three would be uh, depth of interest so how can i make the detail actually more interesting and more appealing to the viewer and then we'll talk uh, just briefly on uh, uh, design creation. And uh, basically this is kind of talking to designing for laser cutting and 3D printing and what's possible. And then just a really quick overview on laser cutting, um, the opportunity. It's not so much about uh, kit companies like ourselves, it's more about how, do, how does the modeler access um, laser cutting and 3D printing? Because I, I know there's probably been lots of seminars on 3D printing and, and laser cutting, but this is kind of just to get you a, a, a flavor of it. So basically, what, what details bring the model to life? You can see in this image that there's this, uh, this is one of our kits, but it's, uh, it's fairly detailed uh, in this image, but it's, it's kind of drab looking. Um, I mean, the detail level is there, but the, the, it's really not bringing it to life. So when you add the details, you can see that now there's a there's an opportunity to bring a scene and a story to your to your product, to your uh, your kit. And really, you can see this addition of uh, signage, um, gas can, obviously, somebody's getting ready to go fishing, they're going boating. Uh, up here, you can see there's um, uh, some of the torches that are about to be worked on the boat, sawhorses and things. So it, it really helps details really help bring the uh, bring the structure to life and, and tell a story. So in this particular uh, image, you can see that this is a, a building that I wanted to represent and, and what really adds and brings flavor to that. So obviously you can uh, do some 3D print or some printed paper signage to add to that to really uh, kind of tell the story. Um, you notice there's unique trim on this building that kind of brings a personality to it. And probably the uh, things like a step um, that you might not notice in the picture until you actually think about it. And uh, the door has a unique uh, look and feel to it. And of course, there's big windows. So that means there's probably should have stuff going on inside. Otherwise, it's, it's the viewer is going to look at it and go, okay, there's nothing going on inside. It's not that interesting. And this particular building has unique cornice trim um that i hadn't seen anywhere else so i wanted to make sure i could figure out how to represent that as well uh, so the the corner trim uh, this is something that was easy to the cornice trim was easy to do in 3d printing uh, the easiest way to do it so i uh, had to create a, um, a file to uh, to generate that and represent what was on the original building um, and try to do a fairly close representation of what it what it was. And uh, then creating the illusion of, of what's actually there. Uh, we uh, laser cut a custom door for it. Uh, the front panel of the building has a lot of uh, uh, features to it. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see that layering the material can add a ton of detail as well instead of just one strip for for corner trim or, or uh, upper trim uh, layering it together in different sizes will bring that that uh, illusion together quite nicely and of course then you can google signage and uh, come up with just about anything on the internet that you can then take into programs like gimp corel draw or adobe and uh, cut and create uh, paper paper signs and then for a simple interior, it's uh, you can use those same programs just to print onto a piece of paper, uh, the background, and as long as you offset that from the front of your building, 
and don't put it right behind the window. It really gives you an illusion of depth and things that are going on inside the building. So you can see you can take that uh, that building and do a fairly good representation of what uh, what is in your image or what you're trying to prepare. So this uh, this is a, a kit that we do uh, from that image, and it's in HO scale and O scale as well. So can you actually go too far? Um, my answer is no. You can never have enough detail. And, and if you can actually generate it, you should actually try to do it as, as my feeling. Um, in this particular situation, uh, uh, the full interior of this of this vehicle, uh, you actually you put the sink drains in the sink and uh, the door has gla glass on it. The only thing I didn't do that I should have done, and uh, my wife thought I was crazy, but, uh, what I was going to do is put a turkey in the oven and a light in the oven to actually light up the oven. So, and of course, lighting the inside is uh, uh, necessary to bring out that attention to what's what's there. But it could be a simple strip light that's on top and fed down through the vehicle. And uh, in this case, I actually cut open the uh, the shelf of. Uh, closet door and actually put bottles uh, on the shelf that's inside the uh, closet, which you can only see by looking through the kitchen window. But nevertheless, it does does cause people to cr crouch down and look what's in there and see what's uh, in your in your model. And then another good um, detail in bed is these, uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're uh, micro beads. You can get them at the uh, uh, craft stores. Uh, they make a great door pull um, <clears throat> in HO scale. And as well, those same beads are really good for generating things like fruit and vegetables in baskets, but uh, they're quite, quite reasonable and you can get them in all sorts of colors as well. So you can see my favorite scotch bottle in the window of the, uh, of the, of the vehicle. So how far should you go in, in uh, detailing? Um, my opinion is uh, you need to go far enough uh, so nobody can say that uh, you missed something. So in this particular structure, uh, I wanted to generate it from a movie called The Untouchables with Sean Connery and, and, uh, and team, um, generated the, the uh, building exactly the same as it was in the movie, uh, right down to the uh, Kennedy biscuits on the shelf um, a little box of Kennedy biscuits. The uh, flower station over here is uh, is reproduced, and the stove. And you'll find that the books and and items that are on the table are uh, generated the same as in the movie as well. So I don't think I got all the pots and pans right, but I came close. And including the uh, decorative wallpaper, which was done early on with uh, newspapers um, stuck to the walls of the building. So uh, the idea of the detail is uh, you need to draw your viewer into the uh, the scene or into the building. So that's where lighting comes in handy and creating your details inside that to actually tell the story are quite interesting because over here you can see uh, somebody has put an ax uh, in the, uh, the wall to stick the ax in the wall and, and uh, someplace to put it, didn't have a shelf to put it on. The pot belly stove actually has, uh, you can thread up an LED from the inside and, and uh, light that stove up if you want. And then of course, all the tools on the shelves and miscellaneous items underneath of it fill up the, uh, the picture. Then sometimes you just need to, instead of an interior, you just need a simple hint that there's some life going on uh, in the, in the uh, building. And uh, that's easily done by, you can see here, instead of an abandoned building, there's some life going on because there's some items out on the front street. Uh, basket, it kind of gives you that opinion that, that people are doing things inside your, your tiny building. So here we have uh, <clears throat> a kit that we, we built. Um, and it looks kind of rather mundane building at first because it's, it kind of reminds me of a Walther's building but it's got, uh, it's got some things added to it that really add uh, flavor to it. And by simply putting the signage and outside items and having some inside things that spill onto the outside, like these tables and chairs outside front, um, kind of draws the viewer towards the, towards the model. 
And then of course, uh, as you look at it closer, you see the interior detail and that really captivates the viewer uh, to tell them the full story. Here you can see how it turns out. And of course it's the uh, Soprano from, if you have watched this TV series Sopranos, it's the famous pork store. And, and the only thing I didn't do is in the dumpster on the side, there should be a body inside of that actually that they probably disposed of. <clears throat> Excuse me just for a second. The, um, the idea of the interior on this one, um, it's the only building I've ever done that I've actually had to drill salamis and cheese um, to put inside. And uh, the 3D printed, these are 3D printed layers of uh, sausages and cheeses that slide into the, the uh, freezer that, that's there. Same with the, the tray of food on the side. And then a various variety of, of 3D printed items um, that are here. Sorry, are we back? Yes. Okay, because you don't want to look at me in early in the morning. If I could turn my face off, I've got a face for a camera, as, as Clark would say. So, or <laughs> a face face for radio, I should say. Right. So, a um, little talk about lighting. Uh, lighting can really set the mood of your of your model. Uh, in this picture, you can see that there's uh, there's a lot of detail going on uh, in the daylight. It kind of gives you that I, the lighting and and uh, uh, daytime view kind of says, hey, you're out in the desert. Um, there's some things going inside the building. You can see that uh, the signage lights up, um, but not that noticeable. But then if you actually take the same picture at dusk, uh, kind of brings a mood to it. You can feel that hot uh, summer evening out in the desert. Um, again, lighting adds adds a lot to it. The Coke machine, the the uh, the uh, tele telephone booth, lighting and interior is is lit up. And then that same view at two o'clock in the morning, um, you can hear the cicada bugs running and the, the buzz of the fluorescent lights of the sign that are there so it it really can change the mood of what's going on where the porch lights on here but the interior lights are off uh, there's a newspaper sitting on the bench um, telling you that somebody was there earlier it's actually a life magazine i should say and then uh, lighting can attract that attention so having the the signage lit up in the uh, coke machine um, all that's needed is a uh, uh, sound bites or something small there with a couple of compressors running to to really bring the image to life. These 3D printed uh, bottles and uh, trays, the the lettering on the outside is just a decal, a water soluble decal that I made up, um, stuck to a 3D printed tray. And then the hardest part is is getting the Coca Cola in the little bottles and trying to get those little bottles into the trays. So, um, but comes together quite nicely with 3D printing. Same with the phone booth. Um, I think Bob knows how, how much fun these phone booths are to put together. And I think uh, he mentioned that he made a few of them and uh, adding that little cord to the, to the item just kind of brings it all to life right down to that level. So there's multiple levels. The, the further you look, the more detail you see. And my opinion is, is if you can take that right down to a quarter sitting on, the, uh, on the, the counter that somebody left, that would be the best thing possible in HO scale. We'll go through this at the end uh, a little further, but um, uh, I've got a video on this trailer that I would like to show you as well and putting it together. But again, simple hints of what's going on in life. There's no lighting inside, but uh, the addition of curtains on the outside really uh, help tell the story. Same with the uh, blinds that are on the, uh, the windows of the, the doors and, and uh, side windows. And then stuffing that into a scene by adding the uh, ironing board and refrigerator outside, kind of kind of tells you a story that hey, this there's uh, there's a rundown guy, uh, red redneck Earl living here rather than uh, Granny with her nicely uh, looked after trailer. So we'll switch a little bit, uh, just a few minutes to uh, laser cutting. Um, basically, uh, the uh, uh, touch on some methods here that you can look at and why you should consider laser cutting. So um, instead of hand cutting something, 
Um, and I, I kind of use the view in my scratch building or my model making for my own hobby. Um, if I'm making a complex part that has many accurate cuts that are needed, of course, it's easier to do with uh, laser cutting. Um, I need a lot of the same part um, that are cut at the same time. That, that's the reason to use laser cutting. And if I need customized textures on my parts, uh, such as stonework or bricks, et cetera, that, that you've probably seen a lot of the uh, other manufacturers do. And um, the most important thing is I need to know how to draw in a vector uh, drawing in the CAD program. So people go, oh, it'd be great to have a laser cutter and put my little model together. But the hardest part of the whole thing is learning CAD. And uh, that's the most time consuming part of, of putting things together. So um, I apologize, I didn't find anything out in Ontario. That I didn't look for anything out in Ontario. But who can cut your stuff instead of doing it yourself. Um, most trophy shops or engraving shops, um, a lot of them will sub out their uh, laser time. Um, so if you can provide the files to them, uh, you can talk to them and they can do custom cutting at so many kind of a dollar or $2 per minute kind of uh, runtime on lasers. So there's also these maker labs that are, are local. Um, we even have one out here in Salmon Arm. You can go and work with them and they can cut your files. You can uh, get time on their lasers. Uh, so consider the trophy engraving companies. Um, there's uh, other online companies. We uh, used to do custom cutting. We just don't have the time. But people like RS Laser Kits, I know uh, Rich does uh, custom cutting that you can send down to him. Manzo Laser Works is a uh, stuff for all over North America and in our hobby and is also in the uh, radio controlled uh, aircraft hobby. Um, so that's a good way to do it. And of course, the thing you need to do is learn vector uh, drawing programs that you can do in, in uh, things like Tinkercad, CorelDRAW, AutoCAD. Uh, we use Rhino, uh, which is a, a fairly good production program, but it's, uh, it's kind of costly. Um, what can you achieve with um, the typical uh, trophy kind of lasers? Uh, we use Epilogue lasers, but things like uh, Trotec or Universal. Uh, lasers are things to look for. You can get repeatability down to about a thousandth of an inch or a thousand and a half inch. Um, the kerf uh, is typically anywhere from four to eight thousandths of an inch uh, using a 1.5 uh, inch lens. And you can get uh, feature sizes down to about 15 thousandths of an inch to reproduce without burning, burning edges and things off. So things like fine mullions uh, on windows, you can get down to about 15 or 20 thousandths of an inch. And then the rastering resolution, you can go up towards uh, uh, 15,000 uh, dots per inch, which is about 16 microns, which is pretty fine, fine work. Um, what type of materials do we like to use? Um, basswood, uh, aircraft plywood, uh, acrylic works well, acetate. You kind of want to stay away from the polyvinyl chlorides and things like that because they uh, produce acids that can, can damage your machine and optics. Uh, passboard, cardboard, matboard, laser board, or what's called polyback, which is a, uh, we use a lot of that uh, for our, our fine detail parts, which is, it cuts nicely with a, a knife as well, um, but uh, sands and works like wood, but kind of deals like plastic at the same time. And it's basically a, a um, resin impregnated craft paper that uh, is used. Uh, styrene, not so much. I, I don't get a lot of success with styrene. Uh, you get a lot of uh, buildup on the edges and you get a lot of rounding. Um, it's, the, the, it can be cut, but you don't get as nice a fine, fine edge at the end of it. So there's usually a lot of cleanup with it. Um, some basic rules for laser cutting. Uh, basically what you do is uh, you need to have different colors for different uh, effects that are happening on the laser. So if you, in our case, we use black uh, lines, black hairlines uh, to for things that are cut and then a red hairline or a green hairline or a different color hairline for things that are using a vector cutting mode of the laser, but not so uh, high intensity. So it's actually engraving a line in the material and not cutting all the way through. And then uh, usually black and white or gray scale images are, are rastered. Um, so that, that'll be areas where it's kind of like the laser is pulsing at a very high rate and it actually can and is, uh, is eroding material on the surface of the, uh, of the product um, to give you a, a rastered image kind of burnt into the, into the item. 
So uh, you want to make the drawings as well, the same size as the material sheets that you're going to cut for them. And you also want to put uh, one of the worst things that uh, most uh, engravers don't like to see in things is you got to have little tabs. So um, little areas of lines so it doesn't fall out of the fret because, you know, for a home laser, it's okay. But if you uh, go and cut all this and then pick it out, and now you've got just a pile of little parts in there, you don't know what's scrap and what's, uh, what's there. So having uh, little tabs uh, notched in your lines, uh, little spaces, uh, keeps the product on the on the sheet and that way you can remove it all as one big sheet and and send it out to uh, your uh, your person that you're sending the parts to. So one of the best ways of adding uh, detail in laser cut products is to is to do uh, layers and it adds a lot of texture and detail. Um, the example you see here is there's 53 parts that go into this front wall assembly. It's a little over the top. Uh, but I wanted to do uh, a detailed interior, which nobody can see because you actually have to look through one little window in the back of the building to actually see what's going on inside. But uh, you can see uh, here how all this comes together and adds a tremendous amount of detail to your, your, uh, your facade at the end of the day. Another place that laser cutting shines, um, these are fiber optic lines. Uh, that are uh, plastic fiber optics that are red and yellow. And these are all driven by a single LED inside the building, but having this all cut and uh, holes drilled in it by the laser, when it comes together, it gives you a nice accurate awning. Um, this would be very difficult to do. It's drilling all the holes by hand, um, but everything lines up perfectly. And then you just feed the fiber optics into the, into the holes to get your, your uh, run lights. You can also have two lights flashing back and forth and it would give you a, um, a chase, a chase around the building. In that same building, um, laser cutting some task board uh, and then soaking them in water and, and wrapping them uh, was able to create a whole bunch of these little chairs in a hurry instead of trying to do those as 3D printed or, or scratch building in, in some way or form. Um, method that works really good, and especially if you use task board or what's called butter board, because when you soak it, it makes it very flexible and, and uh, can conform to, sh to shaping quite well. In the upper left hand corner, you'll see uh, 3D printed parts on the shelves and, and things that really add a lot when you look in the building and look to the back of it. So again, as I mentioned, uh, doing laser cut parts that are, are quite repeatable. Um, this is a, a light uh, system that goes into, the, into our, our uh, 1950s gas station and made it simpler to use just a laser or a 3D, or sorry, a um, um, LED strip light um, that's set in place. And then to get these details of uh, kind of that 50s uh, motif on the, on the top is just a series of layers that are stuck together to slightly larger and slightly smaller and then use some alignment pins to, uh, to go into a dowels uh, to set your layers in place and do them in the right order. And then to fish that down into the, uh, the light standard. Same with the gas pumps, they're, they're done with a bunch of layers that are stuck together so that you can put things like the, uh, the meter, meter inside of it and it gives it some, some depth when you're looking at it. So quickly on 3D printing, um, 3D printing could be your friend if it, if it, if it decides to be. Uh, and I like to call this how I spent $1,000 making $100 worth of parts. Uh, but truly, once you get it into 3D printing, it can be quite, uh, quite a useful product and, and a great way to, it's really helped um, explode the market on what's available in, in, in details and what can happen. There's lots of 3D printing uh, companies that have come out and making some wonderful details that were never available before. So things to remember about 3D printing, again, the biggest thing that I tell people is uh, you need to understand 3D software. You gotta be able to do some, some 3D modeling uh, to put together to create uh, what's called an STL file, a stereolography uh, file and slicing programs. Uh, the type of hardware is dependent. Uh, is it a DLP, which is a projected uh, single source light from underneath or an L, uh, which is more popular now is the LED uh, screens that are, are directly underneath the machine. 
um, 2K or 4K resolution makes a difference. We'll talk about quickly um, low peel force uh, chamber in this, in our particular production machine, this lower chamber actually tilts to peel away the, uh, the uh, product off of it as it, as it cures. Uh, figuring out supports and orientation is probably the biggest thing. If, if you're going to make one 3D printed part, it's difficult because you'll probably have several failures until you figure out how to support that structure as it's being 3D printed uh, so that the pieces don't come apart as you're, as you're printing them. And then preparation cleanup, uh, that's, that's a big deal because uh, it's, a, it's a very messy, uh, the, uh, messy way of printing or of creating a product. So as I mentioned, a typical 3D printer has a, a build platform up on top that moves down into the resin vat. Um, this resin tray has a clear um, plastic um, screen on the bottom. And then there's a light source from below that's actually directly underneath that, um, that plastic sheet. Or in this case, it's projected from down below the machine where it's safe and can't get resin on it. And then this low force uh, pivot peel is what makes the difference in price. Uh, because you need a very ac accurate way of transiting this uh, this tray tilts back and forth up and down to peel to slowly peel the product away. So you can imagine the the build platform moves down into the resin. It sticks to the bottom of this this PET plastic sheet, and then pulls straight up. Then it puts a lot of force on it, and it, it's almost a bang when it comes off of that uh, that uh, a sheet. This this, this method allows it to kind of start at a corner and peel it upwards. Uh, but again, you, you pay for that price, but it's, it's a good idea for us for production. Um, so 3D CAD models, thinking about them when you're, when you're making them, you're really looking at uh, complexity through simplicity, as I call it. You know, in this case of the foam booth, uh, you start off with a rectangle. Uh, you need to trim those corners down. You need to hollow out the inside, uh, then add the foam. Um, you'll see we actually add the letters by removing them. So you draw the letters, subtract them from the items. So there's a few basic commands that you get back and forth. And, you know, within a few hours of playing with a CAD program, if you haven't done it before, uh, you kind of get the idea of the basic shapes and things. And it's, it's always a bunch of basic shapes that are either stuck together or removed to, to make what you're doing. So you, you just have to imagine what that looks like. In the case of this engine, it looks like a very complex engine, but it's really just a bunch of basic shapes of, of uh, tubes, um, hexagons, rectangles, uh, uh, trapezoids that are stuck together uh, to make the item. And so you can see this is a series of cylinders here on the upper right, um, and then uh, uh, a trapezoid and a couple more cylinders stuck over top of each other, and then it's all welded together. And then uh, building supports, how do you put that product together so that it, it can be taken apart? You got to remove all of these separate little green items at the bottom after it's built. So you got to go in there with nippers and, and clean that off, but that's just the way to, the item gets supported. You got to think of the, of the printing process as doing a bunch of layers and uh, slices of really thin uh, layers of your product. And so uh, layering it together and making sure you're supporting minimum of what you need to support and not having too many supports. That's always a balance. So I won't go through this. You'll, you can look at this in a little bit more detail afterwards um, when you're uh, um, offline, but kind of the pros and cons of, of uh, should you buy a, uh, a 3D printer? And I think the bottom line is you can produce some really awesome results. Uh, you, need, you need the files to, to feed the machine um, a lot of those files are available if you're just a home user online. Uh, machinery, uh, vehicles, uh, railroad details, they're, they're all out there on places like uh, STL, STL Trader and things. You can get them for free or you can buy them the files ready to go or you can make them yourself. And I think the biggest thing that we see is the, uh, the mess of it. So you just have to have a station set up where... If you're if you're going to be if you're messy in the kitchen uh, uh, cooking, you're going to be messy at this. It's it's a matter of keeping a very uh, clean clean environment where you can work, and uh, because you, this resin gets everywhere when you're working with it. Uh, lastly, we'll talk a little bit about printer resolution. If you are thinking about a three D printer, so. Um, 
the resolution that you can get out of it? Does it matter? Well, it depends where you're looking at the item. Uh, in this, you can see uh, the resolution of the 3D printed item. The gas meter in this case holds up at a distance and it also holds up at a very close uh, a view. So where you're putting it on the layout, it kind of draws the, the viewer in and the closer they look, the more detail they can actually see. And what does that mean for the human eye? Here you'll see, uh, we, when you buy a 3D printer, you'll see uh, things now, kind of what resolution it's important to look at. Uh, 50 micron resolution here, you can see that regulator on the top, it's, uh, it's got definition. Yeah, but the new printers, the 35 micron uh, resolution, you can actually get down to resolve the individual screw heads that are in that regulator at a very small size. And this just gives you an idea. It's, it's basically printing in pixels. So um, <clears throat> down here, you see what uh, 100 pixels by 100 pixels look like at 50 microns as they do at 35 microns. And compare that to your actual CAD drawing. So the, the uh, definition gets very good now and just in the past year going from 50 to uh, 35 microns. So here you just have a kind of a picture of what you get when you buy a different uh, printer. Um, kind of the new standard is the Elegoo Mars 3 or Pros and Sonic Minis. Um, they're kind of in the, they're actually below this, I even think now they're 500 to 600 dollars. Um, and that 30, I, I just recommend it for our stuff, especially if you're working in HO and N scale, that going that little bit extra distance on the 35 micron machines uh, does make the difference uh, for what's available. And then of course you can spend up to $3,000 for a, uh, a laser laser guide, uh, laser um, injected machine or a uh, uh, production machine. So to kind of wrap things up, um, this view gives you kind of an idea what you can do with details, um, kind of picking out what's in the scene. Um, the walls are layered together to add depth for the window frames and uh, interior details. Um, engraving the ceiling details. When you're looking at the product going upwards, you actually see into the eaves of uh, what's in the building. Uh, interior detail, uh, interior LED lighting, uh, of course, brings the ins inside to life. Uh, those interior details of paper printed walls with pictures on them, and et cetera. Uh, the wood stove inside, actually, uh, you can put an LED inside that to have a flickering fire when you look in the window, the tables, the chairs, the cabinet, the fridge, uh, bed upstairs. Um, I'll show you in the next, uh, at, the, at the end here, but uh, laser engraved details on the flower boxes, including flowers and things in those boxes. Gives you an idea, definitely there's life going on here. Uh, 3D printed cooler has uh, beer and ice inside of it when it's open. So you look at it, which is very important. Um, and then the 3D printed barbecue uh, has a thermometer on the front of it, as well as knobs and uh, lid handle and the propane tank with a valve. And of course, barbecue condiments and a beer sitting on the, on the side of that. And then 3D printed toys makes the scene kind of pulls you right up to the lake and, and makes you feel like you want to go out there and go splash around in the water. So that's kind of it for the presentation. Um, I did have a video that, uh, do we still have time for that, do you think, uh, um, yes. team? Okay, yep. so I'll uh, share you guys a video here. Uh, of course, Bob's going to be bored with this because I know he's seen it before. You just just bear with me while I make sure I uh... okay hopefully this won't be jerky so I will try to I'll do a little bit of talking for it but I'll try not to move on the screen to make sure it comes through okay come on So if you go to our uh, YouTube page, uh, we have a lot of detail uh, uh, videos that we're doing on making details um, called the art of video. These uh, little glue applicator, I can't speak highly enough about them to go to Michael's or to uh, Amazon and buy them for accurately putting glue into place uh, that you wanna see. Of course, painting the details before you put them on the model helps a lot to add definition.
just cleaning up the glue on the inside to make it uh, come together nicely. And then I apply a lot of glue to the inside line instead of the outside of it to make sure that it comes together and uh, doesn't have The laser board is nice, but uh, adding reinforcement to it really helps keep things stiff and square as you're putting things together. Instead of trying to do a lot of uh, thickness by the walls themselves, you can just add corner bracing and things to square it up. This is a really simple detail just to cut in some lines on your blinds, uh, picture blinds, and pull the corners down kind of give that uh, broke, broken uh, feel to them. The paper on the back of the acetate can be a pain, but it's a real good way to keep your fingerprints off the inside until you uh, install it, because you never notice that until you install it, and then you can't clean the window after they're installed. So. And then turning your knife towards the part will always keep the tab so you don't have as much cleanup to go. So kind of scraping to one side, the, the part side of it. And then putting glue just to the outside of the frame and not to the back of it too much uh, allows you to keep things in place without getting glue all over your window. When I reinforce these little parts like this too, I, uh, you'll see here, I add glue to either side of them. It kind of reinforces it. So not just glue the part in place, but, but actually add some glue to either side of these enforcements that you'll see next here. Yeah, like this uh, really, really helps give the, a lot more strength to tiny parts, keeping them in place. And again, if you don't have one of these glue applicators, I go to Amazon, they're, they're about 60 cents or 70 cents if you buy them in a bag of 20 of them. And they can, uh, they really help uh, put the glue where you want it. And another trick is low, low tack masking tape, uh, painter's tape, the low tack stuff, um, to hold parts together while they're setting up. And uh, that way it won't peel your paint off like normal masking tape does. I use watercolor pencils to add uh, depth uh, kind of to weathering after doing painting. Uh, you don't have to, but you can also then wet these uh, areas that you drew on with water and kind of smooth things out with uh, a little bit of water with the artist uh, pigment that's on it left from the pencil. So the pencils help you put pigment where exactly where you want it. Putting your finger over top of the part as you cut it um, loose of the, the fret really helps from keeping it shooting the part across the other side of the room. And in this picnic table, I put tabs on the outside of the uh, small parts that are held together until after assembly, and then you cut those tabs free keeps all the little parts in place while they're gluing them up.
And if you put your detail paint on a little thicker at the end here, like I do with the yellow, you kind of adds a three-dimensional effect to the, to the beak. My favorite way of applying glue to these is dab it in the glue and then, uh, then put the part in place. Keeps, keeps, keeps a lot of spill out from turning out on the part. Again, putting your thumb over top of it as you cut the part free keeps it from flying away. Now we'll bring it together with a uh, building the scene. I have actually found a pro bond wood filler is a very good scenic material. It's got a lot of stickiness to it and it sands really nice once you put it on so you can add texture with wood filler uh, for your base. And then this two inch, two millimeter craft foam makes a great road base. And you'll see, I put plaster over top of that. This is just glued it in place. And then uh, now I mix plaster and paint, uh, put a very thin layer on top and keep smoothing it out. And that allows you to crack uh, the asphalt surface afterwards with exposing the foam underneath. And then just scratch through the, the plaster with a knife and then brush it clean. And then just use a pin wash or panel wash to, uh, to color the cracks. And then just highlight it with some dry brushing. That's just modge, uh, matte Mod Podge for the uh, glue, scenic glue. Dries very nice. You can't see it when it's done. And then when you glue your models down, always weight them down with something so that it goes right down. Doesn't look like your, your item is floating. It's actually embedded in the structure, in the scenery. It's like the icing on the cake. <laughs> See that? 